Welcome to the DNA Talks podcast, where we take on the mission of unlocking the code of your genetics. This season is all about you, upgrading your health, not just on the surface, but down to the root cause. Join us as your clinicians at the DNA company investigate your DNA and beyond. The intention of this podcast is to enhance your lifestyle by changing what is in your control. This does not substitute the medical advice given by your personal doctor, therapist, and other healthcare professionals. Welcome everybody to episode one. It's happening all over again. New podcast, the DNA talks. And the whole intention here is to dive deeper into your genome, give you those personalized insights, work with our clinician team. You know, there's, there's so much that anyone that's been listening to Unpilled or has followed us up until now, there's so much that we've learned, uh, so much we've uh, been able to apply genetic insights to and help people with. We now know we need to dive deeper into this particular topic. And so this season is going to focus there. And what better way to start than tell you about the people who are going to be telling you all the stories, which is the DNA company team, including our ferocious leader, our glorious leader, El Capitan, Tracy Wood. Good morning, Kashif. How are you? Good, good, good. So good. Our story of how we got here, I, you know, I worked with Tracy, by the way, for months, many months behind the scenes that people didn't see Mm -hmm. to take all of what we've learned. Here's what's the truth about breast cancer. Here's what's the truth about chronic diseases in general, aging performance. And how do we take this and bring this to everybody? And the context of how everybody works is, does my doctor know this? Is this covered by my insurance? Does my healthcare plan cover this? Does my employer allow me to do this? And so there's a big gap between all of what we know, the goals that everybody has, and how do we bring them together? And this is where Tracy had been working behind the scenes for many months to take what we have and make it fit that model. Uh, and it's it's very exciting that we're now going to be able to reach everybody. And the intention of this podcast number one was not only to introduce her, but to talk about some of what's broken in that healthcare system and why we feel this is so important. So first of all, awesome that we're chatting here today. You know, and um, very excited. I think people need to know because people know your story in terms of your acumen in building and running businesses, but just like myself, there's a personal story behind all this. And there's a reason why you do what you do. Yes, there uh, is. So if you don't mind, we can tell everybody where that comes from. So, yes, I, I've been a serial entrepreneur for the majority of my adult life. I have built and started several businesses that were based in the very beginning of telemedicine before people were actually looking at doing therapy online we created the first online therapy portal before BetterHelp came along and did what they did. So I, I've been in this space for a while, but I wasn't always in this space. I wasn't always in healthcare. I actually was in telecommunications. I was in telecommunications my entire adult life from you know majority to my early 30s. And what I did there was I understood network and connectivity and the internet was exploding. So I, I learned a great deal about how to really kind of weaponize what we were learning technologically to expand both utilization of the internet in in your regular business to what then became, you know, creating online stores. And then Amazon came out and the whole thing really exploded after after the millennium. I, I really stayed mostly in technology until my youngest or my oldest daughter was born. In fact, she was born 21 years ago today, Kasia. Hmm. Today is her actual birthday. Oh, That's wow. Awesome. So oh. when when Bella was born, uh, she was a very healthy kid, super active, very outgoing, very energetic. Um, and then we had one right after her, 18 months after her, Katie. And when Katie got about six months old, Bella got sick. And she was exceedingly lethargic. And it was literally overnight. And when you touched her, she bruised immediately. So we knew there was a problem with her platelets. So of course we went to a doctor. They said 911 Children's Hospital. She has this really rare uh, form of leukemia. It's idiopathic, thrombose, something. It's ITP for sure. And this was kind of where 
the whole thing started for me to work from home and create a business. Um, and Bella's 21 today. She's great. But there was about 14 years that we had to watch everything. If she fell, I mean, her platelets went down to almost none. She was bleeding everywhere. Um, and it was a horrible experience for any parent to encounter. And so after Bella started treatments and, and became well, I was really concerned about Katie. Is this genetic? Is this something that can now, you know, repeat into my other child? So about 2007, February 3rd, actually 2007, my eldest sister died of a drug overdose. Hmm. Now, Jackie was 45. So relatively young. She had, uh, two children, uh, one developmentally disabled son and uh, a 16 year old daughter at the time of her death. And we were gutted, the whole family. We, we had no idea what was going on. We knew Jackie wasn't right. Jackie had told people for years that she had one disease or another and she was being treated for all these different things and nothing ever seemed to have a level of truth to it or cohesion to the stories. Well, she died in her apartment and a doctor that was treating her told the fire chief that she had cancer and that he expected Jackie to die and to oh, just wow. send her to the mortuary. There wasn't going to be an investigation. None of us believed Jackie had cancer. We knew something was wrong, but none of us believed that she had cancer. So about 14 days after Jackie passed, we're all still just very confused. Um, devastated. And I got a call from the corner and introduced who he was and said, are you the next of kin for Jackie Ports? And I said, I am because I was Christopher's conservator. And he said, there's a problem. So what's the problem? He said, the psychiatrist that was treating her and wrote all of those prescriptions hasn't responded and won't sign the death certificate. And I said, well, why is that? He told the fire chief the night that she died that he was going to sign the death certificate on Monday. And he said, that's what we want to know. So we have to claim the body and you have to sign a release. Mm. And so I did. So that started a six month long coroner's inquest onto how Jackie died and why. And I found out my sister was schizophrenic and was being treated by this psychiatrist for schizophrenia. But she also told the psychiatrist that she had cancer and that she was being treated within his medical system, a huge medical system, and that she couldn't get her oncologist to write the prescriptions for pain medication. So would he write them? And he did for five years. He treated her and treated her every single month for five years, increasing the pain meds, increasing the opioids, increasing the sleeping pills, but also increasing the schizophrenic meds and adjusting those medications to help Jackie with her schizophrenia. He changed her schizophrenic meds for the last time, five days before her lungs stopped working. And essentially it was a combination of these two drugs that Jackie's body could never have taken and been able to, to manage and live. And that's how she died. After that, I, I wasn't, I mean, none of us were ourselves, right? I mean, you can imagine what that's like. Hopefully you never have to imagine what that's like. So I, I went to therapy for me because I had to deal with making all of this make sense to her son who could not process anything. He was in debilitating grief for months, couldn't work, didn't eat. It was, Unbelievable. But the rest of us were kind of going through that as well. And during my therapy, the, the two years that I was there, I realized that someone like my sister couldn't have gotten help online for a bunch of reasons. One, she was poor. And two, she had a mental disease or defect. Mm. And in the system that we all serve, those two things are often catastrophic. And of course, the other thing is, is if you're a minority. So I recognized I wanted something to change and that there had to be some way I could figure out how to change it. And that's when I started the initial business that was online behavioral health and, and 
Then it became behavioral health and wellness, episodic care, and it grew into what you and I merged into the DNA company. So yeah, that's and, really what got me here. And I, I knew that there was complexity to the American healthcare system simply because I couldn't understand it. Right. But I, I didn't understand how that complexity was rooted. I thought it was rooted in providing superior service. You know, up here in Canada, we think that everything in the U.S. is great and advanced. And, you know, right. what I learned is it just this moat around payers and money and profit yes. that makes things so complicated. You know, and you, it's, I mean, it's sad to this is what happened to your sister, but that's also the third cause of death in the United States right now. Right. Medical error with pharmaceutical drugs. That's correct. It's unbelievable to think that, you know, when you're being vet through a clinician whose primary role it is to diagnose and treat, that that's the third reason people are dying. Right. You know, and that like, was a lot of the reason that I came here. Gosh, if, if, if you remember back over a year ago, you were talking to me about this testing and this revolutionary idea and how to take the, the DNA interpretation and layer it with that concept so that people like my sister don't have to die like my sister. Yeah. And I, so that was really what brought me to want to come and work uh, within your organization, but also to change what's happening. Like you just said, people look at the American healthcare system and say, you have the greatest system and you have all the money and you have all the testing. And while a lot of that is true, we don't have that personalized precision medicine ideology. And that was the other piece to what you spoke to me about. You said that precision medicine is here and now. The problem is, is everybody doesn't know. Yeah. And so, I think that yeah. speaks to this. When you think about the American healthcare system, the $4 trillion a year that's being spent, and we think that, wow, it must be incredible. But the reason it's being spent to that degree is because of it being, being, it's being done backwards. Right. The chronic disease management, you know, where it's masking symptoms. And so uh, Americans spend, I think it's an average of $12,000 per year. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, it's like 5000 Right. Same health, same people, you know. And what we're, what we're learning is all that money is being wasted on not dealing with precision and not dealing with prevention and just right. maintaining people's low quality of life in a disease state. Right. right? It's that, truly a reactive sick care system. The sicker you are, the more attention you're going to get. But when you're well, if you don't know what's underneath, if you don't know genetically that maybe as you approach midlife, you can't clear your estrogen or you can't clear your detox. If you don't know those things as you start to age, you have no ability to proactively fight that. So then you become reactive. You get to your 40s and your 50s, and now you're in a reactive model. You don't feel well. You've got brain fog. You're constantly tired, but you can't sleep. There's a million things that had we have addressed it, identified it in your 20s and supplemented it during your 20s, your 30s, and so on, had we have done that, you wouldn't be screeching in at 55, feeling horrific, and really being aged beyond your chronological age. Mm. And, you know, the other big thing I learned from you, and this is why, you know, the work that you're doing, taking this company forward is going to be so impactful, that insurance isn't actually insurance. I thought it was, right? And I thought insurance means I'm covered for my costs. I'm paying some guy a fee. And when I learned about things like carve outs and how bills are paid, you know, for example, you can walk into a pharmacy and pay them cash four or $5 for a pill, mm -hmm. right? And once they find out you have insurance, they're charging you $10 for the same pill. And there's a carve out of seven or $8 that goes back to the insurance company. So essentially, you just created a giant profit for the insurer as opposed to, you know, them paying for your bill. You've paid more out of pocket, $10 in this copay, right? And they've carved something out to put back to themselves. And I had no idea that it was more an administration contract. Like we just, we own you as a customer. Right. And your health is administered through us. Uh, but other than a catastrophic, like I got to go to the hospital type scenario, it's not covered. And this is also why people are struggling 
and you mentioned it with your sister, you know, depending on your economic status, you can't even afford your medication. Right. We had a patient come to, uh, to do one of the programs with us a couple of weeks ago. And she said, you know, I was just, I was admitted to the ER earlier this year. You know, I, I'm curious. And so what happened? She said, oh, you know, I had like this chronic pain. I thought I was having a heart attack. I went to the ER. My blood pressure was super high. They thought I was having a heart attack. You know, they started doing, they did a CT, they did an ultrasound, they did all of this chest x-ray testing, and et cetera. She said, and then I got the bill. Mm. And I said, how much was it? She said, $42,000. I said, how many days were you there? She goes, I was there four and a half hours. Oh, wow. And I said, okay. I said, so how much did they make you pay? She said, you know, here's the interesting thing. While I was laying in the hospital bed, they offered me morphine, which I refused. And they came in and said, we need you to sign all of these papers. Mm. And I said, well, it's a good thing you didn't do the morphine. You wouldn't have had capacity to sign the documents. Now, this woman was a lawyer. She said, that's exactly what I thought. Yeah. I said, how interesting. She said, and then they said, um, you haven't met your deductibles so far this year. So this is going to cost you with your copay and your percentage because you're in network. Congratulations, you're in network. It's only $8,000. Do you want to put that on a card? Yeah. And she said, it doesn't work that way, young lady. And the bill <laughs> turned around and walked out. So then she gets the bill from the insurance company, $40,000. The insurance company writes back to the hospital. And the way a carve out works, Kasia, is the insurance company says, look, you're one of our partners. You're in network. So if you bill $10,000 for a bed, I've agreed to pay you 3000 for the bed. So I'm taking that 7000 off the bill. I don't keep that because nobody ever pays me that, mm. but I'm not paying the 10 grand. Now, had you been a cash pay, you'd have paid that 10 grand. Mm. So that's how the carve out works. So the insurance company took the entire 40 some odd thousand dollars and the bill came out to $1,100 when it was done. They carved wow. the entire visit with the hospital down by 30 some odd thousand. And then the testing literally more than in half was carved out. Unbelievable. This patient left with no medication in their system, Kasha, if not one drug. Yeah. And how many people just don't know and end up paying? A lot of people don't know. You know, we have advocate people here, right? Our concierge people are, are advocates. And one of the things they do is they tell them, don't pay the bill for six months. Now, the insurance companies and the providers don't appreciate us telling people this, but it takes months for these guys to all figure out what the net sum sum is. And then as the consumer, we have to go back and we have to look at what the bill was and ask for the breakdown of the bill. Normally, you get this bulk number and they don't give you anything from what the charge master has delineated. But by law, in fact, it was signed into law, uh, I think under the last administration, that the charge master data has to be posted in every hospital. So people now know that. Now, this past year, uh, the Senate and the House, I believe, passed, uh, I think it's called the uh, No Surprise Act. And it's centered around this very thing. People go, they get sick, they have insurance or they don't have insurance. They get hit with these bills. And if you don't pay them, they immediately go after your credit. They immediately start trying to attach your wages and they're allowed to do that now. So mm -hmm. you've got to dispute it in the very beginning, but you're still not getting to the root of the problem. If you're going to the ER, that means you already have a problem. And that was the part that I wanted to get involved with, with the DNA company. I wanted to know before there was yeah. a problem. Right. I've had both of my children tested. I now know a lot more about them and how to help them and how they can help themselves than we would ever have gotten by going to a regular wellness uh, visit at a doctor's office, including with a blood test. Mm. Yeah. And how like as much as you know about this industry, my experience has been, you know, people that want to pay out of their pocket executives, wellness enthusiasts, sure. people, 
what is the likelihood of this science actually making a dent into the healthcare industry and becoming a part of it? Is this a 10 year thing? Is it a, a quick catalyst? I don't, what is the reality? You know, I think that I think there's a lot of ways you can look at it, right? Again, you've got people that are healthcare enthusiasts. People are more fit than they've ever been. People are more active than they've ever been. We know the average American is now living eight years longer than they did just 10 years ago. So there's a lot of great trends in health and wellness, but there's also a lot of dangerous trends in health and wellness. And I think that if you don't have that scientific baseline, it's hard to know what your body can tolerate. It's hard to know what you should or should not do. And so I think that when you look at what we're doing, not just with the PGX testing, where we can tell if you're going to have a reaction to a, a commonly used drug or a medication or an anesthesia, not just PGX, but if you look at the microbiome tests that we're doing, if you look at the, the genetics that we're doing, we give people that foundation. And what I'm trying to do is have that recognized here in the U.S., have that recognized by leading authorities, networks, systems that actually use the testing in the hospitals to help lower readmission, right? If we don't know what someone's going to react to, how can we make sure that they don't have to come back? So there's a lot of different places that you can use this and you can immediately institute it. But, you know, this is the American health couldn't care less system, right? Mm. And in a lot of ways, we don't want a lot fixed because then there's no money in that. Yeah. And so it's a, hard to say, right? It's hard to say what that crystal ball looks like. I'd like to see it sooner rather than later. And I know you and I are both spending a lot of time centered around that in the education of it, in the propagation of the information, and then really just letting people decide for themselves if they want to take control of their own health or not. Do they want to be at the effect of or a victim of the system? Or do they want to champion themselves so that they don't have to rely on it until they absolutely need something that may be just more catastrophic rather than chronic or preventative? Yeah, and this is where I think what's happening now, um, it's going to address this problem so precisely and I don't think, you know, when you're too close to a situation, like you're working on things, I'm working on things, we don't realize the impact and power of what we're working on. Right. Because what's coming is this annual screen. And it's so important because what we're saying is of the top 15 killers, you eliminate medical error. We already talked about that. The other 14 are all inflammation. All right. of them. Except for Cancer is also, um, you know, really deeply rooted in immune response because you're constantly right. killing, killing off cancer cells. So if you take the top two killers, it's, you know, cardiovascular and cancer. You're dealing with inflammation and immunity. And you could either wait for a symptom, which is typically what happens. You have a cardiovascular disease. You have a cancer, even an elevated protein level, something that points to a disease. Right. Or you can seek early detection. And I think that's the thing that is going to change because right now everyone's trying to make small baby steps on the existing model versus just thinking a different way. Forget about the disease, All right? Let's stop looking for the disease. Let's look, start looking for the markers that are 10, 15 years prior to. Right. We know what those are now. So, and this is where I think the beauty of this um, annual screen that's coming, which is early cancer detection. Right. It's looking for genetic fragments in the blood, like tumor samples in the blood that are far before you have tumor formation, where you're looking at epigenetic expression and early, early warning signs that methylation and anti-inflammatory systems are a little overloaded. What's going on here? Right. right. Looking at the gut and the gut being in a dysbiotic state and all of a sudden, well, my immune system is in my gut. If there's something going on with my gut, I'm going to be more susceptible to things like cancers. So right. this to me is... Uh, it seems simple and obvious, but it is the thing that I think is needed. And I'm you know, really happy to work with you on that because it's, I think it's going to make a major dent in this, like, let's change how we think about healthcare. I absolutely agree. You know, early detection 
is what everybody has talked about for 30 years in America. And they've, they've pinned all of their hopes on a mammogram. You know, yeah. they, they're, they're not doing pap smears as often as they used to. They're not doing mammals as often as they used to. Well, you can certainly develop something from year one to year two. If you're doing an annual screening that's a liquid biopsy and you've got the ability to detect the major forms of cancer present in the blood, now you've got a jump off point to go diagnostically and say to a practitioner, hey, listen, here's how this came out. I want us to, I want us to scan. I want us to look for whatever it is that's not normal. You can do full body scans. Those are things that people are, again, doing that insurance still will not cover because it's a proactive tool. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a tumor and they have found it and they believe that it's a problem, they will scan your entire body in the same machine using the same technology that they're not going to cover to find out if you had the tumor in the first place. It just doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. but it's how we do it. We yeah. want to change that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when people realize that there doesn't have to be a, so the, the challenge is people think that their health is through this conduit of an ivory tower. And without that person, I can't access my health because I know nothing. Right. Right. And the truth is that the technology and the data is so much better than it's ever, even something as simple as a wearable. Yeah. Right. Ch heart rate variability, tracking your sleep, a continuous glucose monitor, knowing right. what your food is doing to your metabolic health. Those things weren't known or heard of a few years ago, and now they're easy to access. Right. And so this shift from, I have to wait for a symptom, and then somebody is going to diagnose, and without that person, I don't get treatment because I need a prescription, versus tracking in real time including things like liquid biopsy, but even just your wearables and your sleep and all that stuff and letting the data speak to where you're at. Just like right. we do this for our cars and we don't do it for ourselves. Right. You know? Right. Well, look at a CGM. Okay. You, you mentioned a continuous glucose monitor. A continuous glucose monitor should be something every diabetic type one or type two has covered under their insurance. It is not covered under all insurance for a type wow. two diabetic. Now, if you're doing a weight management program, you can go get a CGM for about $100, $150. If you get one from the doctor, the doctor writes you a script for it, you take it to the pharmacy. If it doesn't get covered by your insurance, that is an $800 item. Wow. But you can go sign up for somebody that's got, you know, Joe's CGMs and there's 25,000 in stock for $150, $200. But Joe's CGM then is not covered by your insurance because it came from Joe and his is different. It does the same thing. Unreal. We should be able, I mean, think about this cash. You bought a car, right? Yeah. yeah. You looked around for the car you went to other dealerships, same brand, but you went to other dealerships. And you may have gotten a different price here than maybe somewhere else in a more affluent neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare should not be like shopping for a car. If yeah. you go to Target and you need to buy a notebook, that Target notebook is the same price at every Target all across the country. We don't do that in healthcare. We will charge you $100,000 for an appendectomy out of Cedar sinai and $30,000 for an appendectomy out of Linwood. Same doctors, same procedure, same drugs, same experience. Yeah. It's broken. That that's unbelievable. And this is where people looking from the outside um, can't navigate or understand it. And me as a Canadian coming in, it was so overwhelming you know, the privatization of it drives all of that, right. right? So is it the same when you're looking at things like Medicare, Medicaid, because that's more government sponsored, right? So Medicare is federally subsidized. Medicaid is the state portion of healthcare within your state. Um, so generally Medicare is for those on disability, obviously our elderly, 
but they still all have to get supplementation programs for prescriptions. They have to buy a Part D program. I mean, it's it's really absurd if you look at the price of healthcare. You said earlier that that people spend fifteen thousand dollars a year on the costs of their healthcare. That's if you're in your twenties, because if you're young and healthy, we charge you less. But the minute you hit fifty, you go from maybe a eight hundred dollar a month policy to a thousand dollar a month policy. Right. And then by the time you hit sixty, now you're at fifteen hundred a month. When you're retired, how are you going to have fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars a month? And that's the why these people have to choose between food and yeah. medicine. It's the time when you also most need it. Right. 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 Yeah. And and then this is way where exactly where prevention becomes so important because the why is it that, that why is that the time when we most need it? Not because aging equals disease, because our understanding of how to maintain ourselves equals disease at that right. age. Right. right. And so you find that the average American has their first chronic condition at 55. You got two by 65, and the last 15 years of your life are spent in treatment. Right. That's that's the American story right now. That's correct. Versus all of those things are caused by the choices you make day to day, the foods you eat, the environmental right. exposures, relationships, all of these things, uh, putting stressors in your body, leading to inflammation, leading to disease. And if that was understood, you could make different choices. Right. And you do not have to end up like that. And you don't need to worry about that $1,500 per month bill because it's unnecessary and not needed. And this is the reality. We've, there's many people that live to even 120. There's a famous story of, a, the, I think, uh, who this lady in France who's the longest living female. She lived to 122. And she was an heiress, a billionaire heiress, right? And so she decided that she wasn't interested in anything other than socialization. And all she did was spend time with friends and have dinners and host events and parties and had literally a stress-free life. Nice. Right? So, yeah. So that one element of her life was about living. That's all it was about. Right. Right? She lived to 122 with no disease. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has a billionaire heiress program in their back pocket to access, but we can learn that even if you look at the blue zones in, in you know those five cities where people live over 100, you often see these very close, tight-knit relationships. Right. There's low stress. There's low... It, it's about ancestral habits, local community-type habits. So you can see that take a city that operates differently, even within the U.S., even within California, mm -hmm. there's a blue zone, yeah. right? You take that city. So what's going on there? They are a highly religious group and part of their religious belief is to focus on health. They have regular events, sporting events, food events, educational events, and it's a part of that culture of that city to focus on health. And what's happening? They're now a blue zone in the U.S. in the same country we're talking about this. So there's right. a little pocket that's surrounded by all the nonsense we're talking about. So long story short, what we're describing doesn't need to be the outcome if you start thinking about things differently. Right. Yeah. But you've got to take action on it, Kashif, right? I mean, I saw a commercial the other morning. Jack in the Box has come out with a new menu item. Now, I have to tell you, I haven't been to a Jack in the Box in probably 35 years. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know what's on their menu, but this is new. And it's a hot dog bun with chicken strips and chips or uh, french fries in the hot dog bun <laughs> and then it's covered with this white creamy sauce looking thing yeah i was terrified when i saw that commercial but do you know that most kids know their food order by number when mom and dad say oh i'm gonna go to mcdonald's i'll take a number two with a soda Wow. They know that menu. They know yeah. those menus better than they know what they're learning in school. Yeah. And that's the majority of American children. It's yeah. it's a choice. We're letting them we're letting them start at a deficit if that's what we're putting into their body. Mm.
And we just let it continue because once we've taught them those habits, they can't, they can't break them without major, major friction. And kids don't want friction. They want participation trophies and they want everybody to be the same. So friction's yeah. bad and we don't, we don't want to push back. I never let my children have soda when they were growing up. They're lucky to have you as a mother. And everybody thought I was horrific. They didn't get yeah. fast food either. Yeah. Because I, I knew enough from what I was learning during all of this with my sister. I knew enough that I understood it starts with inflammation, nutrition, diet, and all of that impacts their executive function, mm. right? Their mood, their behavior. If they didn't have food at a certain time, I have one child that's like clockwork. She turns into an absolute maniac. But it's because her body is looking for food and she's holding out. Mm -hmm. You know, the more we do proactively, the more we say, here's your lunch, here's your dinner, here's, you know, structured snacks. The more we do that, the better we can support them. But again, as adults, we, we don't put that discipline on ourselves. So we're certainly mm -hmm. not going to put it on our kids. Yeah. And people say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Like everybody's doing it. Well, we also have more chronic disease in children than we've ever, ever, ever seen before. Autism right. rates are through the roof. I mean, there's a, there's a million things you can link to those things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of those ingredients are a very American problem. Cause you look at the breads and the sauces mm -hmm. that you're describing, literally the European union, China, they, they refuse to allow those right. things in their country. They're banned. They're right. literally banned. Yeah, so and they imagine. should be, but there's a yeah. lot of money in that stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. So now, you know, we look to the future and as I said in the very beginning, El Capitan, you know, we're going to take all of what we have yeah. and all of what we built in terms of these insights and we're going to try and fix everything we talked about here today. Yeah. You know, this is the landscape. This is the reality. Everyone knows it. Um, and everybody's complaining about it, especially what we just went through in the last few years and people realizing mm -hmm. how fragile we and the healthcare system both are. Mm -hmm. Right. So people are open. Their eyes have been open to changes required. You know, most people didn't have a need to think about medicine or, you know, but now everyone's been sort of touched by it. Right. You have 66% of Americans are on some kind of prescription drug or diagnosis mm -hmm. of chronic disease. You know, so it's a prolific problem. And the beauty of all this is this is a sort of what better purpose can we have than to serve humanity by taking what we've learned, filtering it through what you've learned, right. and allowing way, way more people access to it. Right. You know, had my sister have had money, I believe she'd still be here. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's a, a big part of why I am still here. Mm -hmm. I want people to be able to afford to do our programs, to work with our practitioners. People have a choice and they can choose better for themselves. They can action these insights. Learning about my own genetics helped me make sure that I didn't make a lot of the same bad decisions that killed my father. But I didn't know what I didn't know until I found out. And I think it's important that as we do teach people to really get a collaborative role in their healthcare, I think that we've got to emphasize testing. You've got to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So I love that, that we created the annualized program. Liquid biopsy, I think is a game changer. I, the, the epigenetic tests, I mean, there's, there's so many ways to look at where you come in and where you go out. Mm -hmm. If you are aging faster than your chronological age, you have got to do what you can to get more years back. Look what you did. You yep. took 10 years back, Kashif. Yep. And That's eliminated that, that, that 10 years, you know, the, the starting point wasn't how do I reverse my age? It was, how do I get out of bed? Right. Right. It was like, I can't go to work today or I'm at work and I need somebody to drive me home. I can't function. Right. That was a starting point. So first 
understanding and and I was in that position of here's five doctors, here's five pills because I have five different conditions, literally. Right. And getting MRIs, not getting any answers and just another medication, another medication. And it wasn't until I sort of forged forward and said that I'm going to figure out what's going on with my body. What's the missing piece? What did I eat wrong? What did I do wrong? This doesn't add up. And it was in that sort of journey that I first discovered how the body actually works and we don't need to be ick, uh, sick and you know we don't need to be experiencing chronic conditions and so after all that was done which took some time I then got to a place where like wow I don't catch the common cold anymore I don't have migraines anymore I have crazy energy what else can I do right and I started optimizing and I started supplementing and I started exercising properly for my genetics and how I need it. And that's when I got down this path of reversing biological age. So, and this is the journey that everybody goes through and should go through, which is let's deal with the acute problems, get it out of the way. What's your pain point? What's the problem? We will right. get rid of that because we understand why it happens, not just what it is. Right. Once we get you past that and the terrain has sort of, you know, breathed a sigh of relief, now we can start to optimize it. Let's get you to peak energy, peak libido, peak hair and skin, peak everything. Right. You get there and like, well, how far does this horizon go? What else can I do? And then you get into sort of longevity territory and regenerative medicine and biohacking tools and things that can get you to where, you know, I'm still trying to get a little younger, right? And not, right. Because, uh, not because of any vanity, but more like, for me, the simplest way to say it is... I was born with this God-given gift and I want to return it in the same condition I got it. Yeah. And to me, it's a high form of worship and a high form of obligation. Right. Right. And it's what my kids deserve from me. It's what my mother deserves from me. Right. You know, so it's, 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 it's what, and it's not adding more work and time. It's just shifting my priorities. And all of a sudden I still get everything done. I still see people. I still go out. I still do everything but this has become a part of my life. So I think we just need to get everyone started on that journey. I agree. Yeah, thinking about that healthcare, their, their healthcare different, understanding that there are tools now, you know, the right. amazing stuff that you've put together and the programs and there's, there's just very easy ways to do this. And knowing that the question of, okay, well, you know, I'm, I don't want to spend any money on my healthcare. It's not a choice. You either spend it now or you're going to spend it later. Right. And you're, you don't want to be spending it later because it's going to be a lot more money. Right. right. And, you're, and you're not guaranteed a quality outcome from then and forward. You know, yeah. it, it's there's there's so many moving parts and pieces to it, Kasha. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think is so important is how you took this on and how you really gave that life back. You gave that life back to your children, to your grandchildren who are not even here yet, to your mother yeah. who is still here. You gave all of that back by pushing forward, even against friction, even against things that were uncomfortable. And I think that that's a huge part of the message. As parents, we have a responsibility to our children, to our grandchildren, to leave all of this better than we found it. Yeah. And I see it, you know, when I go to school events or I go to like a wedding or something and I see I, all of the people that are my peer group and my age and I don't feel like I'm their peer group and their age. No. And I think about, and I see them drinking their Coke and feeding their kids garbage. Like, don't you want to have a better quality of life? Right. You know, and, right. and here's one last note about this is that the, that person will typically say, well, I'd rather enjoy the life that I have than get rid of all this fancy food and Coke and all that to, to live an extra five years. That is because they're stuck in deriving pleasure from that stuff. Right. The brain right. gets satisfied from many things and you can just satisfy it from healthier things. And you just, it's like a palate shift, right? All of a sudden you will start to enjoy saying no to that thing that you used to say yes to. It just requires right. a walk. It's just a much better place to be. So this is what I see everywhere I go. Everything's a choice, Cash. You may yep. not always like that choice, but everything is a choice. Yeah. So this was awesome. You know, the intention was to let the world know, you know, what's going on, not only with us and the company, but also in healthcare and why this is needed, right? Why, why is this purpose and mission important? 
Why do we do what we do? And we're not going to stop doing it. And now the tools have been developed to make it even more impactful, you know, and as we start this new season and we start a new year, um, we're going to hit the ground running with some very powerful tools to change lives even further. And it's awesome that you get to lead all that because of your history and your knowledge and your ability to take all of that and plug it into the systems that a person like me doesn't understand. And, you know, we're honored, customers are honored, team is honored that, that you know, you get to lead all this. So this is an amazing place to be and excited for the future. Well, and, and I'm excited to be here. We have a lot of clinicians that, as you know, we've brought on a lot of people that are going to be coming on here and helping us push more information, more education, more resources, more affordability options to, to everybody that comes into our ecosystem. We really want people to be able to get their needs met. We want to meet them where they are and we want to be able to take them and their longevity as far as they're willing to go. So I'm excited about it. I appreciate it. Amazing. Episode number one. Couldn't have been any more important than this. Thanks again, Tracy. In the books, brother. Good to see you. Thank you.